I've wondered at what point did Kabbalah really catch my attention, or what lines were being read the moment I saw the Zohar as something more than just any other text. Unsurprisingly, it was in the very first pages, recounting the stages of emanation tied to arcane and paradoxical scenes. And today we're going to talk about that process of creation. Or I should say, we're going to discuss the chain of being from the infinitudes of Ain Sulf to the final revelation of the physical universe. I'd like to preemptively thank you for joining. My name is River, and welcome to the Nemeton. To really grasp the details of the situation, I've compartmentalized this grand cosmic dance into sections, based on the parts who theme, or divine faces and sacred names. Insulf isn't really a part suf, but as the totality of them, it seems befitting. And for newcomers, a part suf is a face which represents a revealment or aspect of the totality. Uh, I believe a comfortable way to look at it is along the lines of a massive play. Yet all the characters are played by a single individual, of course, without any limitation of physical reality. With all that being said, let's look at these anthropomorphized metaphors and names that I've used to break up the video. We're going to go ahead and start with Ein Sof, then into Arikan Pin, Elohim, and Ziran Pin, and hopefully there will be a little bit of a surprise ending. Where do you even really begin with such a great situation as that called only Ain? In fact, it's theoretically so impossible that there are hearty restrictions on the contemplation on the essences thereof. So we won't be wasting time making up fun theories or ideas. We're only going to discuss the textual statements, which we can consider facts. Ain simply means nothing or not. However, we know from the discussions on metaphysical genesis that Ain is more rightly a great something, as in it is the everything of divinity, as discussed in something like Betul Hayesh. So, if this is a chain of being, we must realize that Ain Sof, or that which is without end, normally noted as a different tier, is really more so just a quality of Ain. If Ain is without limitation, without bounds, Ain Sof. You see, so this quality is like a revealment of Ain. And by revealment, what I mean is through particular metaphysical philosophy, we note it is a quality of it. For example, you have qualities like eye color that reveal internal factors of yourself like genetics, which is an expression of your internal essence. In the same way, certain actions you do reveal emotional qualities, which is also derived from these essences of your being. Which I will admit, we as people cultivate through experiences, decision, and environment. Which leads us into a quote on how to understand these lofty tiers of the divine. In Adir Bamaram, we find... It is self-evident that any expression regarding the emanator, blessed be he, refers only to his actions rather than his essence. This is entirely true, in that no one can know the essence of another person, or in many ways struggle to know their own, but their actions and what is chosen to be shown to others is a dim reflection of it, as brought up earlier. A way we can tie this over to the psychological considerations, looking at someone's ego doesn't always tell us about their subconscious nature. And even further, if we were to say what is their essence, it, it's an even deeper matter, further disconnected from the entirety of it. It's quite an interesting thing. We now come to the third tier, which is Ain Sulf Or, another quality, if you will. This is the infinite light, or light without end. This isn't a revealed nature, but it's rooted in metaphysical philosophy, and such a situation in which there's a capacity to emanate does it out of itself of its own form and likeness. Uh, we can lightly rationalize this quality and its ability as making something from oneself, in oneself, as oneself, <laughs> which is pretty dope and totally impossible in, in our scheme or sense of things, but it's like a hyper-meta infant energy machine. But even then, that's not a good example. If you want to look at this idea more, refer to Philo Judaeus's allegorical interpretations of Bereshit, or most would call it Genesis. Now the big question was, if all was made within that great infinitude, how would there be any descent by which we could exist as we do now? As in, wouldn't we be like candle flames in the sun, hardly existent if at all? This fantastic question was brought low by the later and well-respected, I might add, Isaac Luria, or the Holy Lion, 
Skipping the history lesson, Luria heavily popularized an idea which we call Tsum Tsum, or the Divine Contraction. And this paradoxical, possible impossibility, was the flexing in, if you will, of the Great Infinitude within Ein Sof, which thereby formed a cavity within Ein Sof, yet ever so slightly disconnected from that infinite state. This is the actual creation of the nothing, or capacity to receive, which by the way this receptacle is similar to what we might call Shekinah, or a revelation of a meta Malkut in relation to the infinite divinity. Anyway, we've finally made it to the emanation part. So the Tree of Life we all enjoy talking on is about to become more relevant to this discussion. Now with this Seam Soom, there's a space to work with but I have to clarify something about this space. In general metaphysics, any closeness to an infinitude that the human mind can comprehend by way of symbol is a circle. Or at least we use a circle for convenience. This space is however also infinite, and it's kind of hard to get into, but it's like layers of infinitudes. Similar to how the Sferot, or Sephiroth if you're hermetic guys, are also infinite and layered. Alright, let's do this. The first occurrence takes us to the Zohar. A hard spark made an engraving upon the supernal light. In many ways, we can make arguments for and against the stance of the Zohar and the stance of Luria. However, fortunately, there's no need to do so because of a nice little detail, which is the Kav, or line of light. The Kav is the channel, or we might say way, by which this light of the infinite expression of Ein Sof moves into the space generated by Sim Sum. Because of this kav, the engraving of the hard spark can also be interpreted as the descent of Ein Sof Or's light into the nothing. Which brings us to the next quote. The spark was inserted into the center of a circle, which was neither white or green or red or black. As the spark assessed, rather interacted with the space, called in the text, made its measurements, it created colors that shone, and within the spark a fountain sprouted. To continue, two faces emanated, one cleaving and the other not. This is the revealment of Abba and Ima, who covers the sides of a Rikonapin. You might often see illustrations of the Tree of Life with a father and mother figure about the sides or pillars. Further, forceful blows split Atik, who is a Rikonapin, in a concealed supernal point shown. Beyond this point, nothing is knowable, and because of this, it is called by the name Beginning or the Reshit of Bereshit. Let's take a step back. It says, and within the spark, a fountain sprouted. Much of this prior scene has been in part the revealment of Kether and the Partsuf Arikan Pin, to the extent that we understand the almost non-existent natures of it, as it relates to a human perspective of supernal matters. But Rikon Pien will begin to express itself outward. Let's take a moment to look at the qualities. Noting points from apples from the orchard, Parshas Toldot to be specific, there are two lights of Kether, being an inner dimension and an outer dimension, which are called Atiki Omin and Atika Kadisha, or just Atika, respectively. This outer dimension or expression of Kether is what we formally call a Rikonpin. In a sense, we have a further elaboration, which is on the word Ain. That each letter of Ain, which is also the letters of the letter Ayin, when spelled out, being Aleph, Yod, and Nun Sofit, represent the supernal Sferot in Kether, which is to say, Kether of Kether, Chokmah of Kether, and Bina of Kether. Noted by Gershom Sholem in Shoshan Soto 1b, which I'm pulling from Beginning of Wisdom. Back in the Zohar, Arikan Pin expands his form into a head and body, which is to say the supernal intelligences and their extension. The Rosh, or head, made a headless body out beneath it, in the sense that it sprouted a headless form out from itself as a ruling agency of the intelligences over that body. The body is, of course, metaphorical for various coming external expressions. Arikan Pin creates a chamber for his honor and glory, 
described much as a silkworm who covers itself in its own silk, which can be imagined as taking one's own capacity of self and forming a garment from it. We see this specific example used in the commentaries of the Zohar. This garment, covering, also called chamber, is known by the name Elohim. We should look to an interesting segment of the Zohar detailing the divine will and further displaying the expressions here. The sides of a Rikanpin have the words Eye thereon, and Elohim is on the crown. This is referential to Eye Asher Eye, the phrase I am that I am, noted in Shemot or Exodus 3.14. The detail, or we might say the secret, is that Asher is the same as the word Rosh, or head, which is a Rikanpin but the resh is at the back instead of the front. Essentially, this is the revealment of the head mentioned earlier, but in a more direct scriptural display. So to continue, we need to really break down why these expansions and changes are called garments. On one level, it's a recession of display, in that the covering shows the features at a diminished level, but the garment allows some frame of reference and that a Rikanpin, who is wholly not knowable, but through what is revealed, similar to how we discuss divine action showing something of the divinity, but only that far. Uh, a simple example would be like an invisible person having a sheet placed over them. While the details would be minimal, they would be revealed by their covering. Now we've talked a lot about Kether, but you may be wondering if Elohim normally refers to Bina and Bria then why hasn't Chokmah been revealed more thoroughly? The funny part is, it's right in our face. If we look to Bereshit, which is to say the word Bereshit, we note it begins with the letter Bet. And if you remember the line, forceful blows split a teak and a concealed supernal point shown, it is called by the name beginning. You might know that Bet is an allusion to Bait or house, even etymologically which isn't too far from the revealment of the chamber Elohim, the chamber literally being the letter bet. Referring back to apples from the orchard and the Zohar, we can note that Arikan Pin formed a chamber for his own glory and honor, yet at a moment there was a concealed supernal point shown within, that is to say, Chokmah. And in the letter bet, you can have a Dagish, which is literally a point, the point inside of the letter bet. This is a further allusion to the intermingled actions of Atziluth and Bria, as in Chokmah and Bina. If you'd like more information on this, you can refer to Tikkun 5 of Tikkun Eha Zohar, which speaks lengthily on the dot in its chamber, and the extensions on these matters, but for the sake of this talk, we will not be going that far into it. Now we can move into the next metaphysical stages. It says a Rikanpin plants a seed in the chamber, which we know as Elohim, to bring forth holy souls. Noting that Elohim is referential by gematria to nature, we will get a full expression of the Kabbalistic imagery. Elohim as a name has 32 mentions biblically, which is a combination of the 10 sayings of creation, because it says, and Elohim said 10 times, at, at least by illusion, and the 22 letters by which they can be said. Another matter is that Elohim, when analyzed by a gematria based on position, is equivalent also to 32, which is to say the 10 Sferot and their 22 interrelations, called paths, as seen in the Tree of Life. If you remember that Arik Anpin has crowned himself by the name Elohim, it connects the divine intelligences and will into the coming creative process. This type of mentality is a result of reverse engineering the macrocosm microcosm philosophy. But to continue, we gotta get scriptural. Bereshit bara Elohim, or in the beginning Elohim created, the heavens and the earth. That is the first line of the Torah. A famous biblical question goes as so. 
Why does it say God created the heavens and the earth, but again creates the heaven and earth later in Genesis? The idea is these creation events are on different metaphysical levels, and here we are discussing the higher events of creation relative to the world of Bria, also the Sfarot Bina, because of the name Elohim. <laughs> it comes from the word Bereshit itself, which by permutation is also Bara Sheet, meaning he created six. The six is Chesed to Yesod, which as most of you know, is Ziranpin. And the earth, which we've labeled as the Nukva of Ziranpin, is the relation of Malkuth and Yesod. In this current scene, Malkuth is inside of Yesod, as it is yet to be revealed out of it, thus the formation in reference to Sefer Yetzera and the world of Yetzera, which means formation. It's actually about to hit the stage of relevance in many ways. So within Elohim, Bria Bina, the six formative Sfarot will extend and become meta-dimensions. That is described in a few ways. The revealed name at this point is based on three words, such that we have Yod, which is Atziluth, Ahe for Bina, and Avav for Ziranpin, or Yetzera. These three letters can be arranged in six possible ways, which is detailed in Sefer Yetzera as the six extensions that make up three-dimensional space. If you don't know what I mean, there are six major directional points in three dimensions, which are front, back, up, down, right, and left. This is also going to lay the foundation for the experience of differentiation, as in things can have a difference of relation in pockets, which we call moments. In a sense, it's setting up for time to exist. The six is utilized afterwards to distinguish the six days of creation, which is in the later lines of Genesis. There are also revealments of Ziranpin detailed in Apples from the Orchard. Sunday through Friday is Chesed, down to Yesod respectively. And finally, when the sun sets on Friday until it sets again in Saturday evening, that's Shabbat which is the culmination moment at which point Malkuth is revealed. This is also the coming about of temporally relative scenes, as in time exists. And in this state, the world exists. Just never forget how far one word can take you. I wanna thank you all for joining me and a special thanks to the many subscribers, patrons, and friends. This has been River at the Nimiton, and I'll see you next time. Wait. I feel like I'm forgetting something.